Hello, hello, and welcome again to another broadcast of a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly program where we center on what's happening news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, and some of you may know me for this other Beatles program that I host, syndicated around the country, and actually on the internet, so around the globe, called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, the man who's on the pulse on everything that's going on in Beatle news. In fact, it's often been said, he knows what's going on in the news before Paul and Ringo know. Go along with this, Steve. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll go along with it. Actually, it's funny that you say that because, uh, hello everyone, yesterday when I was talking to Patty Boyd, we were talking about you know how much everybody knows is everywhere else, and she said, "You guys in America know a lot more than we know in the England about what the Beatles are doing." And I, I didn't say too much to her at that point, but it's fun. That was funny that she said that. Hmm. Very anyway, interesting. Huh. Yes, they, that was a very interesting interview, by the way. Yeah. Very interesting interview. Uh, on today's show, we're going to be talking about the brand new release on DVD and Blu-ray for a hard day's night. Before we do that. Uh, you just mentioned Patty Boyd. You just did an interview with her. How did mm-hmm. that How did that turn out? That was a lot of fun. Um, it was about uh, she's doing a she's appearing at a screening of a Hard Day's Night um, this Sunday the sixth on Catalina Island in Southern California, and we talked about the movie and we talked to, you know about her and George obviously, and one of the, and. She told me the story of how she got the part, and which was really kind of funny because she went in for this interview, and I get she didn't know it was a movie part. She thought it was a TV commercial because she had done TV commercials, and she had no real interest in becoming an actress. Hmm. But she went into the, the audition and saw Richard Lester, and she had done TV commercials with Richard Lester before, and she thought this was that's what this was, and. After the after the audition, her agent said, "You've got a part in the Beatles movie," and she went, "Really?" So she didn't even know she was applying to be in a Hard Day's Night, and um, but she got it. And so, and there's a you know there's a lot more to that story, and I will tell the rest of it in the story that I write. But it it, it was very good. She it was very real. She was she was wonderful to talk to. She was fantastic. Yeah, I've heard her tell that story before, and of course she put out her book a few years ago right? called Wonderful Tonight. And I had the chance to interview her, too, at the Fun ah. for Beatle fans, too, so she really is a lot of fun. She is. And um, we also, I wanted to bring up, since the last show stirred some controversy, and um, there's been a lot of buzz about this uh, music train, that train was music, featured yeah. in A Hard Day's Night called Train Music, we're calling it Train Music, and whether or not it is the Beatles, it's the music that Ringo plays on the train in that compartment. It's on his transistor radio, and it plays for only a few seconds. And we got to hear the full version of it mm-hmm. as it aired on Chris Carter's show. And Chris was a guest on our show. So I don't know if if I actually asked you in particular whether or not you believe that it's really the Beatles. I'm kind of in the middle. I have to say that when I saw the movie originally in 64, I... Kind of, I kind of thought it was them. It sounded enough like them. Now it, it you know, you listen to it now with a more, uh, you know, with a, a more experienced ear hmm. from all this Beatles stuff that I've listened to, and some it does and it doesn't. It sounds like it was made not to sound like the Beatles, but kind of sound like the Beatles if you, if you get what I'm saying. Um, you know, it, it sounds like somebody, that. It has that generic feel to it. Well, I wouldn't. Uh, other people have said generic feel. I think it has more of a disguised feel. You know, it, I think is is a better term. Hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I'm. I think it's possible that that maybe if the whole group wasn't there, it isn't there that somebody was. The strange part, and I mentioned this on Facebook last night, is that there's no record of it. That may be the giveaway right there. Um, that you know, there's nothing in the session session logs. You know, Lewison didn't write about it. He's been quoted as saying he didn't know, he doesn't know for sure. Um, there's been a lot of doubt now. Um, nobody can find the Walter Shenson interview that was meant, that's been 
mentioned as saying it was. There have been several people who have now said flat out that they don't think it's them. I'm not ready to say that. I, I you know, I can see the arguments to, to that, but there's enough of a sound. I think the lead guitar sounds, and we, I, I, Patty Boyd and I talked about this too. I think the lead guitar sounds like George. She, by the way, was not familiar with the song, so she couldn't come up with an answer. Hmm. I don't want to say no just yet. You know, I, I think there's evidence on both sides. Um, I'm not sure if the evidence on the plus side is really credible or, you know, how much you want to go for that, but I think there's, there is something to be said both ways. I think it could be either way. Yeah. I don't know. It's really but, tough. You know, we have trained ears now where we think that we know better, and it does sound like it could be them, but um, after listening to it several times now, I really feel like the drums are not Ringo. They don't sound like Ringo's drum fills. Right. So, and, then, and, and a lot of people have said that, too. Mm-hmm. So I doubt very much that they would have recorded without Ringo in the studio. You, know, it, you can go back and forth on this. So it's just um, it's a very interesting thing to bring up, and, and there's a healthy debate going on about it, which, which I welcome. So uh, it's a good one, thing. One, one point, though, to mention when you say about you know th- that Ringo's not there... I think it's in at this point in 64 or in 63 cuz actually they are in 64 when this stuff was recorded. Hmm. The Beatles weren't were still, you know, they were I mean a hard day's night, you know, they were booked for a hard day's night before they were really 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 big. You know, the the uh, the, the movie was they started working on this in late 63. That's before they hit the US. Mhm. And I think it's very possible that, you know, in 66 or 67, that would never, nothing would ever, ever happen to, you know, in a situation like this where all four of them weren't involved. I think early on that could have very well been the case. Um, and, may, you know, maybe I'm just kind of wishful thinking, but I think it would have been more likely to happen for our days, not much than it would have been for later. That doesn't necessarily mean it did, but I'm just saying that there's that possibility. Hmm. I don't well, know. you can make a, a, an argument on either side. So sure. Until we get to the bottom of this, and I hope until we, we do. Get to, until we get to, we need the rock. Where's the rock and roll detective? We need Mr. Birkenstadt. <laughs> we need to talk to him about this. Anyway. So why don't we talk about uh, the new DVD and Blu-ray for A Hard Day's Night? Um, I watched it a few days ago, and I watched all the bonus material. Mm-hmm. And I must admit, I'm I'm far more interested in all the bonus material than in watching the movie, although I love the movie. I treasure it. It is a classic. And we are talking about it because 50 years on, it's looked upon as being one of the greatest movies of all time, certainly in the rock field. Right. So um, I liked the picture quality of what I saw. I watched it on DVD. I don't own a Blu-ray. Not I yet. Do. I do plan to get one. You should, but, you, yeah, you definitely should. The Blu-ray is, is gorgeous. The Blu-ray looks really tremendous. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's um, the best Blu-ray I've ever seen, but it is it, it is a, a marked improvement from from what has been around. It certainly looks better than the Canadian Blu-ray that came out, you know, that uh, kind of uh, came out um, under the surface there, but but. Um, yeah, it's 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 really nice. It's and it's and one thing that's really weird is how many times number one this has come out since '64, mm-hmm. and how many times it's come out on Blu-ray. I mean, I'm sorry, not on Blu-ray, on DV, on DVD. I mean, we've had you know all these DVDs so far, but I, I'm glad that it's finally in print again. It should never go out of print, and that's that's that goes without saying. <laughs> that goes without saying, but it has. Yeah, I know. It has, and that's I don't think that that's not a good thing. And I hope this remedy that remedies that. I hope this is in print for a long, long, long time. Well, there's always that thought that when it's out of print for a while, when it does come back, then there's more of a demand for it. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's so that was certainly true with Yellow Submarine. It had been out of print for so long. That wasn't necessarily true with Magical Mystery Tour. But with the, with Yellow Submarine, it certainly was, and, and I'm glad that, and, and actually, it wasn't out of print all that long. I noticed before the Criterion 
just came out that the Miramax set had gone, had risen in price a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the way that happens anyway nowadays with with the internet. So, but um, is this the best print you've ever seen of it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the best. I think it is. I think it's the best print. Are there certain scenes that, in particular, look sharper than ever, or is there, is there anything that I think the whole thing on, on on Blu-ray, the whole thing looks very sharp. The the contrast is fantastic. It's really nice. Did you notice a difference between the quality of the Blu-ray and the new DVD? Did you compare those? Yeah, I did. I did. There is a there is a marked there is a little bit of a, a, a quality difference there. The Blu-ray seems to be a little sharper and doesn't have the the regular DVD seems to have a little graininess. I don't know if you noticed it. Um, I thought so. Yeah. I mean, I'll but, be honest. I wasn't totally blown away with the DVD. I think it's the best picture I've seen, but I, I look at it as being a slight improvement. Mm-hmm. Do you have the Not, MPI version? Yes. Okay. What did you think of the MPI versus versus the new one? Uh, I think the new one's a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> so. But, uh, you know, all the bonus features are, are what make it worth their while for me. Because I love finding out information and background about this movie and, and learning more and more about it. So, and that's an interesting, you know, you know since we're getting into the the bonus features, the the whole bonus features thing with the Hard Day's Night has changed considerably from one release to the other, and not necessarily for the better. The new, the Criterion one has a ton of uh, a ton of um, special features, including some brand new stuff. Mm-hmm. But there's stuff from the Miramax version, which, as we you know, as I've, we've talked about this over the past few days, uh, was criticized by some people for having too many special features, which is an incre- incredibly short-sighted, you know, uh, um, idea. But for me, you can never have too many. <laughs> right. <laughs> Keep but piling are, them on. You know, there are things on the on the um, Miramax set that are not on the Criterion. There's stuff on the, for example, and, and, and anybody who has been, you know, who has really loved this film probably remembers the Voyager CD-ROMs. There's stuff from the Voyager CD-ROMs that is not on the new Criterion release, hmm. which is kind of which is kind of interesting. But I mean, overall, I mean, they've done it. Criterion usually does, or I shouldn't say usually, they always do a great job. Their packages, their film packages are not just, you know, the film and a behind-the-scenes documentary. They do an intelligent, they do intelligent work with their releases. Mm -hmm. I know we just bought, um, recently we bought It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, which, and their version is astounding. Um, not only do they have the the full movie, they have the they have outtakes, they have commentary, they have God, they have so many different things. They have hours and hours of stuff, and there's there's a ton of stuff in here too. I mean, mm-hmm. they have for for people who are wondering, by the way, if you, they should buy the regular DVD or the Blu-ray or the dual format. I should say dual format. The dual format is three discs. Two of those discs are regular DVDs, and the Blu-ray is a single disc. And everything that's on the Blu-ray is on the two-disc DVDs right. in the dual format. That is not the case with the regular DVD, the single disc. So if you want everything, you need to get the dual format. It's not that much more expensive, and you will be much. And and it also comes with a a book. I'm, I'm I'm not positive if the the regular DVD comes with the beautiful book in the Criterion, I mean in the um, dual format. But there, there's a beautiful book in there, so it, I mean it's well worth getting that. Yeah, I have the dual as well, and the book looks very nice. It has yeah, an the interview. Book. There's an interview in there with Richard Lester, which dates right. all the way that back comes, to that, 1970. That comes from the old book with the screenplay. And you know that's another thing that that's one of the special features that is that has been on in the past. It was part of the DVD ROM extras in the Miramax version. It was part of the extras in the 
or I shouldn't say extras. It was part of the features on the Voyager CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. um, it was not included in the Canadian Blu-ray that was basically ported from the Miramax set because none of the DVD-ROM features were included. But So that's one of the things, unfortunately, that's missing. And that's too bad. That's too bad because there are scenes from the from the script um, that were cut out, that were left out if you look through the original script. Right. The uncut script, there are scenes. Um, and although they talk about some of the stuff, there are several scenes that were left off. There's also so, photos in the booklet of the of the Beatles from the movie in color. Yeah, that that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. I those were gorgeous. Those are absolutely fantastic. Yeah. The the color photos. One of the highlights of the special features is the uh, interview with uh, Mark Lewison, where he talks about the history um, surrounding A Hard Day's Night, which is really, really interesting. And I uh, could swear there is some, there are a couple of clues there to the second book. But uh, it's great that he does talk about, uh, he really puts a historical um, aspect on the on the movie, and it's it's really a unique perspective. Yeah, I got to tell you, that, that interview is one of the absolute big highlights for me. Uh, because he manages to say in about 30 minutes the whole history of the Beatles, all the important information that you need to know, taking you through their, their early incarnations, the Quarrymen, talking about mentioning Stu Sutcliffe and Pete Best mm -hmm. and everybody else, uh, the problems that they had with Pete Best. And it was all just done very tastefully, and it was so neatly packaged in 30 minutes. Everything right. you'd ever want to know up to that point, leading up into A Hard Day's Night. Exactly. And uh, even some of the stuff that we discovered from his book for the first time, he even mentioned how the Beatles were close to breaking up by the end of 1961 out of boredom. Right. You know, so I think that's it's a great feature to have because it not only attracts a new Beatle fan who wants to know the history, but even the more knowledgeable ones who haven't read Mark's book. So uh, it was something different. I was expecting this to be Mark talking about A Hard Day's Night, and it wasn't. Yeah. One, th one thing to mention, the, the commentary, the, if I had a problem the new ver with the Criterion disc, it's that the commentary track is not exactly synced up to what's happening on screen hmm. for the most part. Yeah. And the reason for that is because, as Martin Lewis told me, it was assembled from the commentary and interviews he did for, in, in 2001 for the for the uh, Miramax version. So, I mean, it's great. It's great that they were able to rescue that because, like I said, um, all that stuff was included on the DVD-ROM, and that content is not available, you know, the way it was. But at least you have the commentary there, and it makes for it does. I have to say, it does make for an interesting. Uh, supplement to the movie. It's mm -hmm. great to hear all those stories. Unfortunately, you don't get to see the people talking. And in the case of, for example, John Junkin, who is no longer with us, that's kind of that is a little sad. Right. Um, Several people. <laughs> right. Who are no right. longer with us. Yeah, I, I'm uh, right after the Miramax DVD came out. It happened to be in Los Angeles, and they had a special screening of it at the Egyptian Theater, and and he was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to meet him briefly, and yeah, you know, so that was that was very nice. I'm glad I'm glad that happened. But um, yeah, I mean that's it, it, it's too bad. A lot of those interviews that were done that were done done up separately and were available in pieces on the Miramax version are not here in the Criterion. Everything has been kind of lumped together yeah. in the commentary. And that's probably one of the shortfalls of the, of the Criterion disc. But I will say that it's organized better than it was before. That it was everything was kind of I wouldn't say randomized, but everything was kind of unconnected with the Miramax version. Mm. It isn't that way with the Criterion, and I, it's a little more unified. So that that's a good thing. They also rescued the Running, Jumping, Standing Still film, right? Which hasn't been which what which the which the mirror uh, the MPI version, which everybody loves, had, but Miramax did not, which was kind of that was kind of a surprise that Miramax did not, and so that's that's a really good thing. 
It's, it's a very yeah. interesting film to watch because yeah. it only it only lasts for about ten eleven minutes, and you could see the seeds of Richard Lester's later work and, and some of what you'll find in A Hard Day's Night. You see a little bit of his style in there. And, and there's also you know much but, is said about how A Hard Day's Night influenced the monkeys and, and laughing and Monty Python's TV show, and you can see a lot of that going back from Richard Lester's work and and work with the goons as well. Mm-hmm. And there's also and there's a new thing called Picture Wise that talks about Lester's early work. And there's also Anatomy of a Style uh-huh. uh, about uh, Lester's uh, filmmaking. By the way, he he um, approved of this package. So this is so any for anybody who anybody who is you know has thoughts about did they do it right? Well, they used what Lester asked. You know, uh, Lester approved. Of this edition, so actually, Anatomy of a Style, which I really like that feature. It's mm-hmm. not just about the way it was directed; it, it had a lot to do with the direction of the story mixed with the music and how it worked together. Mm-hmm. And um, they had two women on there: the story editor and the screenwriter Bobby O'Steen, and uh, the music editor uh, Susanna Perrick. And um, so they were kind of deconstructing the different musical numbers and the work that was done directing them and how it worked with the song and the innovation that was used in the film. I mean, that that's the innovation part is throughout this entire <laughs> package and all the different bonus features. But specifically, it's about the music numbers and how that all worked out. There's so many interesting stories that are told throughout all the different bonus features. And by the way, I wanted to mention one other thing about the Mark Lewison interview. Mm -hmm. Sometimes his own observances are really fascinating and on the mark. And he was saying something towards the end of his piece where he looks at things in an abstract way, and very often with the Beatles, it's not so much what they did do, it's more what they didn't do. Mm -hmm. And often it's been said that they didn't want to make the typical rock film of the time. There was a lot of formula films that were coming out where a lot of the rock stars of that moment came on the screen, got to sing their song or a couple of songs, and it was a weak storyline. Nothing really unique about them. The Beatles wanted to do something different. And you've got to imagine, here are the Beatles. They're finally getting success. For the first time, it's 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 growing in, in leaps and bounds in their home country. They're offered to do a film. Every single band in the world would jump at that chance, you know, to do any film, right? To do anything. But the Beatles were careful not to fall into that trap of doing the typical film of that time. They wanted to do something different. And, and the great thing was that the critics really caught that. You know, they really that was one of the the big things that the critics critics noticed Roger Ebert being one of them uh, you know so it was, this film was one of Roger Ebert's favorites and he you know he wrote this glowing review I remember quoting some of it oh, after yeah. he passed on and uh, yeah so I mean and he wasn't alone by any chance I, I mean by any means yeah. he really wasn't well I think just, just to finish up what Mark was saying there was an interesting quote that he said the Beatles would rather have not made a film at all than to do a film that they didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. And how many bands would have been that stubborn <laughs> to not even do a film if they didn't want to do it? it well, it, you know, and, and I'm not sure that that would have been true maybe six months earlier, but by the time, you know, at, at maybe in late 63, early 64, they were, you know, they had the, the power to, to make that, to do that, you know. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, as you can... You know, as you can expect, you know, early on they probably did not have that kind of writer refusal. Um, so, but um, it's good. It's good that they, you know, it's good that they were insistent that um, you know the quality be there. I mean, Alan Owen was, you know, was was a was a great choice to to do the script. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dick Lester talks about that in some of the special features that. Right. You know, they they wanted somebody that was familiar with their, I guess the culture would be the probably the best word, and he was, and he and they did a they did a great, uh, he did a great job with the script. So, what kind of things did did you learn from all these different bonus features that has stood out for you? 
Well, the, uh, what you just said about the about the um, not making the movie that they that they didn't want to make, uh, or that they didn't need to, they they shouldn't have made. They made the movie they wanted to make, so that that's a good you know that's a good um, part of that part of the film. Uh, I mean, a part of the whole thing. So, I think the the thing about the the Criterion set, you know, is is the historical perspective. Um, one thing, though, that I was going to mention is that the interesting point of the way all these Hard Day's Night releases are done is that the Beatles apparently do not have the rights to the film, which is why there's no direct current interviews with Paul and Ringo like there were on Magic Mystery Tour and on Help. I don't know about you, but that bothers me a little bit, and I really wish that they kind of did have the rights to it. It's too bad that they don't. So. It's a shame that they didn't offer an interview anyway, whether they had the rights or not. Yeah, and and I I know that that was one of the fall offs on the Miramax set, and that's one of the and it's actually surprising that they were able to get Giles Martin to do the the stereo, you know, the stereo audio tracks on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad they did. That was one of the, you know, that was something that everybody that was roundly criticized on the Miramax, and I guess for good reason, although, on the other hand, as I was saying earlier, the Miramax set got criticized badly for a lot of things because people were, you know, complained about the special features. And I'll tell you now, that that DVD looks historic. Hmm. The historic value of the Miramax set kind of has risen somewhat, especially with the release of the Criterion, because a lot of those special features are gone. Maybe someday... They'll all come back together again, and you know somebody will put out a full disc of the whole, the whole thing. I hope so. Yeah, I got to tell you, my favorite feature is apart from um, Mark Lewison. I do love that piece on things we said today, even though it was taken from the Miramax, mm-hmm. because I think that you have all these different people that were involved in the movie, from George Martin to uh, Walter Shenson, Dick Lester, Alan Owen, Dennis O'Dell is in there. Klaus Vorman even has a quote, John Junkin. Some of these people uh, are no longer with us, like Walter Shenson and um, and John Junkin and Victor Spinetti, all these people. Um, mm-hmm. And they all share their memories and tell the story. And it gave me an appreciation for certain people, more of an appreciation, I should say, than I had before. Like, for example, David Picker, who was the vice president of production and marketing Mm-hmm. At United Artists, mainly because he let Dick Lester run the movie. He trusted right. his own instincts, you know. Which yeah. was yeah, which was really kind of interesting that um, because not too many uh, executives in that uh, situation would have allowed the Beatles to do what they did, or allowed Lester to do what what he did. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it was. They were it, the the combination of that and every, you know and everything else was just really really great as far as the movie goes. It mm-hmm. really worked well. Yeah, so. Alan Owen, the perfect choice to do this, the the screenwriting, and and uh, Dick Lester was the one who proposed that he was the screenwriter. And I um, loved and I, I loved hearing I loved hearing from Jeremy Lloyd. Um, <laughs> who, he was uh, the dancer. He was a yeah. dancer. He kept jumping for, up and down, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I have a special interest in Jeremy Lloyd for anybody that um, knows the the British comedy series Are You Being Served. Lloyd was a, was one of the writers for that great series, mm-hmm. and um, so th- th- it was kind of interesting that he was involved with the Hard Day's Night. And he was talking about, and in fact, talking about the dancing scene and saying that he was watching his girlfriend. That was I think <laughs> it was wonderful. That was fantastic. Yeah, and somebody had said, I'm not sure who it was, that it was pretty amazing how quickly Alan Owen picked up on the Beatles mm-hmm. and knew their personalities rather well and could come up with a script that would... I think Picker, would... I think Picker was the one that said, or Lester, either Picker or Lester said that. Hmm. Um, and that was, yeah, that was kind of interesting uh, that uh, they that they did that. Yeah, that's just something else to appreciate. And the fact that there was, as we said, a lot of innovation in this film, a lot of it came from the fact that they were using handheld cameras right up close. A lot of the 
accidents that happened on the film turned out to be happy accidents, and they kept them in. And uh, it kind of reminds me, there's so much about Richard Lester that makes me realize you couldn't have found a more perfect director right? with the Beatles because it kind of mirrored how the Beatles were as artists. The Beatles were one of those those people who they were always trying to explore different sounds and tried to get different effects on their records, whatever it took. And even if what they did was unconventional, if they stumbled upon something, if there was a mistake on the record, it didn't matter. As long as in their ears, if it felt right, they went with it. And right. Richard Lester was that way when it came to his filming. Yep. Because if he there was, were, if was, there were mistakes there, the, just the whole opening scene where, where George falls down and then Ringo falls over him. I mean, they left it that way. Right. <laughs> yeah, he was quite, a, quite the innovator. Yeah. Quite the, quite the, the visionist. I guess is the, he had quite a vision, and it, and, it, and it was really it was really fantastic. I think the, the the one thing one of the great qualities about a hard day's night is that it's in black and white, and I think that helped a lot too. And even and looking at it now in black and white, can you imagine if it had been in color, would it have the same impact today as uh, as it would have you know as the black and white? I don't think so. I think the black and white is one of the reasons why it's so fantastic. Do wow, you? that's that's a real tough question. Because I, I I really do because I think there's a there's a, a great there's a great charm. I, I happen to be a, a big lover of old movies. If uh, you know Turner Classic Movies is one of my favorite channels, and uh, and even bad old movies, I I love the uh, black and white old bad movies rather than new bad movies. And I think, uh, but one of the great beauties of A Hard Day's Night is the black and white. Well, black and white helps to give it more of a documentary feel. Mm, I think it, it, it um, actually Remember, it has an artier look to it. You're saying all this in hindsight. You know, if, if we had been brought up on A Hard Day's Night in color, you might not think that way. That's very true. But remember, at the time in 64, when it came out, there were uh, color movies were, I mean, black and white was pretty predominant. As I, I'm, I'm thinking back, black and white was still pretty predominant. And um, I mean, that's not to say that. I mean, for uh, obviously, you have a, a movie like Wizard of Oz that has both, mm-hmm. um, and Gone with the Wind that's all in color. So not that's not true all the way across, but. You know, there were a lot of black and white movies, and and I'm I'm glad that it's in black and white. Although you're absolutely right, though. I mean, who knows? Who's to say that had it not been in color, then you know, would we feel the same way? Right. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I just think that when you watch all these features, all these bonus features, it really helps to give you such a deeper appreciation of everything that happened in the course of making this movie. Right. And what really impresses me are all the things that are just not planned. Not only just the mistakes in the film. The uh, the scene, one of the, the great classic scenes in the movie when the Beatles are on the field and they're running around and you know mm-hmm. they're having freedom for the first time. They're going on the fire escape and then they do right. the, the Can't Buy Me Love scene. Well, they talk about the fact that at that time there was a helicopter that landed nearby. And that mm-hmm. wasn't something that was planned. And so Richard Lester said, let's film it from the, from the helicopter. Right. So all these unique shots happened because of what was going on around them. Some of it was planned. A lot of it wasn't. And they just went with it. And when you think about the fact that here it was, I mean, the Beatles were bona fide superstars in England. They were just catching on in America. You know, they became the biggest thing in America by early 1964. They start the filming in March. You know, but it's, it's still relatively early in their career, and in the course of under two months, in about seven weeks, they do all the work on this film. Alan Owen captures the essence of the four Beatles really well. Richard Lester does all this innovative stuff, and on a very limited budget, it's really quite remarkable, you know, that they produce something. I mean, obviously, we've said this a million times, nobody knows when they're creating any kind of art if it's going to have any lasting value. Nobody knew that the Beatles were going to be you know, talked about for the next 50 years and more, that this catalog of theirs would endure, that they became what they became. But in the course of all this happening, I mean, this is so early. I shouldn't say early because their careers really started as a group 
with the quarrymen with 57, but I'm just saying it's the start of when they just had world success. And they were able to do in such a quick amount of time and on a very little money. It was a very cheap film that was just made to exploit them, really, mm -hmm. because they really only cared. United Artists cared more about the soundtrack than they did about the film. But yet they still managed to do all this innovative stuff. And God bless Richard Lester for all the ideas and be, being willing to try anything that looked interesting. There's so many shots now that I appreciate more now than before that I didn't even think about. You know, that make it all very interesting, whether they're close-up shots, whether they're blurred shots of the cameras going by in the audience at the Scala, or at the very beginning when, when uh, the kids are running after the Beatles. All that I, I love that. I love that when, when, the, when they run by Paul and Paul puts the paper down. Um, uh -huh. that, that's, you know, that's a classic. Uh, I remember in, uh, in 64 seeing that. They're all, you know, I always had the feeling, too, that some of the shots were set up specifically for audience reaction, and that was one of them. And the other was the And I Love Her segment to, you know, to get, and, and it did happen. You know, I can vouch for the fact that in 64, when I saw the movie, I saw it on the second day of release, the screams were, you know, there were a lot of screams uh -huh. when those two scenes happened. And, and I'm sure, you know, still there's, you know, there are people that, there, you know, there are people that watch it and go, wow, you know. And so, by the way, one other thing that I that I meant to mention, we were comparing the the old and new versions. One of the things that is not on the new version is "I'll Cry Instead," hmm. the prologue from the MPI version, and that was also on the the Voyager CD-ROM. So there's something else. Another reason for somebody to put together a ten disc set of everything. <laughs> Why didn't they just put it all in one package? That's, I mean, you know, who's to say that they're not thinking about that, and that's probably not going to happen down the road. Hmm. The way things have, you know, the way things have happened, who knows? Like we said, the Beatles don't have the copyright on this, so they don't have the rights to this, so who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. We will see, we will see. And I love watching You Can't Do That, the documentary, which is part of this now. I'm glad that that came out. I'm glad that they added that to the the set because um, that is a great documentary you've got Roger McGuinn talking about the birds seeing it and how the, how much it affected them and, and of course Roger Ebert is in it and you get to and really really nicely is you get to see Phil Collins pointing his little cameo appearance and yeah. also it has the original 64 trailer which I really wish that that had also been pulled out mm -hmm. and put with the trailers instead of the two later ones, which really don't make any sense. The 64 one is the one that really should have been uh, should have been out there. Right. Because that's the one that um, that's the one that that I remember. That's the one that first generation fans remember. So, I also like hearing because um, there's always been some debate, I guess, through the years about how much of the script was ad libbed, and um, several times from different people in the film, they said that a lot of what you think is ad lib was really scripted anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, one person, I'm not sure if it was Alan Owen or not, said that there were about 10 or 12 ad libs and they all came from John. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the press conference, yeah. the press conference, that party that they had, a lot of that was improvised. And that's what right. they said, and you can't do that. So. And they had to keep, and they had to sh reshoot the scene Several times, I think Dougie Milling said this. They had to reshoot the scene several times. Oh, right. Or Gordon Milling. They had to reshoot the scene several times of the, I now declare this bridge open because John kept saying different so, things. Yeah. And and I would love to see some of the outtakes of that. No, that would have been that would be uh, that would have been fun to see. But in any event, I'm curious to see how much there is that exists that was not in this film because some of it's in all of these other bonus features too. But right. um, I know back in 2002, when the Miramax edition came out, I interviewed Martin Lewis with Victor Spinetti, and Martin said that there's very little that exists of all the extra footage, because they didn't see the value of it. They didn't see the historical value of it. But we shall see if any we of that, see. If that ever we comes out. Yeah, there, is, there, are the, there were the photographs in the Miramax, uh, or there was the interview in the Miramax version of... Um, I believe it was was it Isla Blair? I believe it was Isla Blair who was in the movie and cut. 
So there you go. Hmm. At least we got to see that. You know, the same thing happened in in uh, Help. You know, there was a scene there that was um, that uh, was uh, done and, and cut. So, oh well. Anyway. All right. Well, that about sums things up for what we want to say about the new Hard Day's Night. Yes. And but, well, I think we should. I think. I mean, it goes without saying. I think. You know, anybody who's listening to this knows that it's it's highly recommend. You know, we recommend it highly. Oh sure. Yeah, I, mean, I would. I would say though that if you can get a, if you don't have the Miramax version, and you can find one relatively cheaply, or the Blu-ray, or the Canadian Blu-ray, I would definitely pick up on those, because like I said, there is a lot of stuff there that is not in the Criterion set mm-hmm. that you know that you would want that you would want to see if you are a student of the movie. Okay. So there you go. And for me, it's really worth worth your while because of all the bonus features. You'll learn a lot just from watching yeah. all of them, or things you may have forgotten. <laughs> and, and and like I said, Criterion has a reputation for doing things right with movies. They always have, mm-hmm. and this is no exception. All right, so uh, if you would like to get in touch with us and send us your comments about this show or any of our shows from the past, you can do so by writing to us at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. If people want to get in touch with you and only you and you and alone, only me, they can write to me at beetlesexaminer at gmail dot com, or look me up on Facebook under my name. There's also my my Beatles group called Beatles News and Commentary, which anyone is welcome to join and you know discuss any of the stories that I publish or discuss any of the issues that are going on. Talk about train music. Talk about Hard Day's Night. Talk about whatever you like, uh, and we shall. Right. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also look at my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And there are quite a lot of interviews. I can't, I can't believe all that I've accumulated on the website. There's a brand new one with Mark Hudson talking about his work with Ringo, specifically some really strong albums that he made in the 90s and uh, the early part of the 2000s, Vertical Man and uh, Ringo Rama and Choose Love. We, uh, we, so, you know, we need to get Mr. Hudson on the show. Oh, yeah. Well, he could talk for hours and hours and hours, nonstop. <laughs> we, yeah, we probably, yeah, we, but uh, Mr. Hudson, and if you're listening, get in touch with us. We'd like to, we'd like to have you on the show. He's, a, he's an incredible person to talk to because he can not only talk about his work with Ringo, and there aren't many people who can say they've worked with most of the Beatles. I mean, mm-hmm. he didn't work with John, although he met John, mm-hmm. but he did work with uh, Paul and George as well. And, um, you know, just for the work that he did with Ringo alone, I mean, I really do think that those albums that he worked on with Ringo are amongst the strongest of yeah. Ringo's solo career, aside from Ringo. And... Um, and Time Takes Time, which is another one that I think is one of his best. Um, that, that, you know, that's funny how that stand, that still stands up today, even in light of the, the current albums, which I which I think are you know are good. But everybody mentions, still mentions Time Takes Time as one of Ringo's best albums. Hmm. Really, and it is. It's a great album. It's a pretty interesting thing that whole period with Mark Hudson because it wasn't just working with Mark; it was working with. Gary Burr and Steve Dudas and members of the studio band The Roundheads and they were on most of the songs on those albums and they co-wrote with Ringo so it was a mm-hmm. real collaboration there yep. and it reached a point where they they really became a band and I think I think it really I mean Ringo Rahm is probably my favorite of those albums but Choose Love really feels like a band album and Choose Ringo Love used to fair. talk about that album that they were in that the small studio mm-hmm. that um in L.A., where the, everybody in the band was real close. I went by that studio one day, and it is very tiny, very tiny. It's mm-hmm. a, I mean, I, I, unbelievable. So, yeah, I mean, that's it, it's really incredible what they were able to do there. Well, I certainly think there was a lot of chemistry in that band. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Mark is no longer working with Ringo, but Ringo is still working with Gary Burr occasionally and Steve Dudas. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, I think Ringo really missed being in a in a in a band effort in the in the studio. Of course, what he does with the All Stars is a completely different thing. 
Right. But, you know, in the studio, he loved that whole atmosphere, and I think that shows in the work. So you can you can, you can yeah. see that in that uh, video special, Ringo and the Roundheads Live. But there is a little bit of a difference there because mm-hmm. there's more of a focus on Ringo. Yeah. And I think some people miss that now. But you know, I think the I think the All Stars do well too. Right. But anyway, you can catch that interview on my website. It's on the More Interviews page. I actually did the interview on the streets of New York on Broadway <laughs> with the traffic going by. Once in a while, you'll hear, you'll hear a honk here and there and a police siren and some wind as and well. And you didn't get arrested. And I didn't get arrested. Actually, you know, the, the sirens did go off, and, and Mark says they're coming to take me away. <laughs> so uh, it's really a good interview, very insightful about Ringo in the studio, and especially Ringo as a songwriter, which is something that very few people have really asked him about, something I'd like to know more about, because from the moment that Mark Hudson started working with Ringo on Vertical Man, Ringo's actually co-written just about every song on his albums, Mm -hmm. which is something most fans don't even know. But um, we learn more about the songwriting process with Ringo and what, what he's like as a songwriter through Mark in this interview. It's really worthwhile. So if you can, check it out. That's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And so that brings the show to a close. I had a lot of fun talking about A Hard Day's Night, the brand new release on Criterion. This is Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time.